Good morning, good afternoon to you all. My name is Soledad Leal Campos. I'm Senior Policy Advisor at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, and I will serve as moderator in this event. Together with my colleagues, Sofia Baliño, who is the Communications and Editorial Manager for IISD's Economic Law and Policy Program, ELP, and Lisbeth Cazier, who is Policy Advisor also within ELP, we would like to war warmly welcome to uh, our webinar entitled Multilateral Environmental Agreements and the Trade Regime, Exploring Options for CITES and Preventing Future Pandemics. As some of you may know, this webinar is the second in a new joint webinar series on trade and sustainability issues initiated by IISD and the University of Geneva's Faculty of Law. One of the main objectives of the webinar series is to foster dialogue on how to shape the trade regime to make societies more resilient, able to cope with future shocks, be it pandemics, climate change, or other systemic threats, and on how such regime can support a sustainable recovery in a post-COVID-19 world. In the first webinar, we had a very interesting discussion on trade and health, in particular on the outcomes of the World Health Assembly and what they mean for the trade regime. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome our speakers, Ms. Sophie Hermann Flensburg, who is legal advisor with the Secretariat of the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, and Dr. Gabriel Marceau, who is associate professor at the University of Geneva and at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and senior counselor in the research division of the World Trade Organization, WTO. After their presentations, I will give the floor to Mr. Marcus Picard from the Secretariat of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE, for a short commentary, and then I will open the floor for questions from participants. I would like to invite you all to send questions anytime using the chat function available in this platform. I see that a question has already been submitted and we are very thankful for that. Before giving the floor to our first speaker, we thought it would be a good idea to launch a quick anonymous poll to get a sense of the degree of familiarity of our audience with both CITES and the W2 agreements. Sophia will launch it and we will look together at the results. Sophia, could you please launch the poll? So as you may see uh, on the screen, this is a two question poll. It's, as I said, anonymous and it's uh, done with the objective of having a sense of how familiar you are to the topics. I think we can give four, three, two, one second. Yeah, so thanks very much for, for participating. So we see that concerning CITES, 40% uh, of participants consider that they are very familiar to the topic because there's, that's their field of work or of study. 31% uh, consider themselves to be somewhat familiar, whereas 29% are not familiar at all. Um, concerning the WTO and its agreements, 23% uh, of participants consider themselves to be very familiar to the topic because that's their field of work or of study. 53% consider themselves to be somewhat familiar, whereas 24% consider themselves to be not familiar at all. So these are very interesting results. Thanks very much for participating. <laughs> so with this very helpful piece of information, I would like uh, now to give the floor to our first speaker, who is Ms. Sophie Hermann Flensburg, legal advisor with the Secretariat of CITES. Through her career, Ms. Flensburg has focused on aspects related to environmental policy, trade, and sustainable development. Some of her previous positions include Manager for Strategic Partnerships with the uh, International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, ICTSD, Attaché with the Permanent Mission of Denmark to the United Nations and the World Trade Organization, and Program Officer with UNEP and UNECE in Geneva. Sophie will make a 15-minute presentation focused on CITES and how it relates to and is relevant in a context of pandemics. You have the floor, Sophie. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to participating in this interesting discussion. Um, I was quite interested to uh, see the poll um, that we have about um, some 70% some that are familiar or somewhat familiar with the, 
with CITES, which is good because I'm not going to speak very long about the convention. Um, I'm just going to give you um, a little bit of an insight, just very quickly, some of the key notions of the convention. Then I'm going to address the two questions you see on the screen. Can CITES be used to prevent future pandemics? And um, what role for CITES? Let me start also by saying that I am not an expert in zoonotic diseases. I'm not even an expert in, in species or in animals. I'm a lawyer, just as Gabrielle. So very technical, tricky questions about zoonotic pathogen spillover, which I've learned for today, um, is not going to be something I can answer. And I think that's uh, that's the question. That's the, possibly the, the case for most of us in this panel. So that's not what we're going to discuss about. But we will still see what um, the convention can do in, in, in this context. So first, um, CITES is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, adopted in 1973, entered into force in 1975. So it's been around for almost as long as me. And um, it is a legally binding treaty, um, multilateral environmental agreement, as we call it, MEA. It has 183 parties, which is 182 countries plus the EU, which is almost universal um, adherence. It's a few more than you have in the WHO, I think. So in that sense, um, it's, it's, as you can say, the um, multilateral regulatory framework for trade in uh, wild animals and plants. It aims to ensure that international trade of wild fauna and flora does not lead to over-exploitation and it does so by ensuring that such trade is legal, sustainable and traceable. The convention works through a system of permit and certificates that are um, that's managed by uh, formally appointed management, CITES management authorities in each of every party to the convention. So we have designated authorities that are managing the system. Um, and uh, they are the ones that are, are charged with issuing the permits and certificates required for trade. The convention neither promotes nor entirely prohibits trade in wild animals and plants, uh, except that Species included in Appendix 1 are considered to be threatened or endangered and must not be traded for commercial purposes. We have about 3% of the species uh, currently under the scope of the convention that are included in Appendix 1. So um, speaking of the scope, it's important to note that CITES only regulates international trade, export, import, re-export and introduction from the sea. We do not have any behind the borders uh, regulations. We do not have anything to do with uh, what happens after uh, trade has been concluded and, and um, products or specimens are found in the import country. Um, it's only the international trade, but it is re-export as well. So even if uh, something has been taken in the wild, passing through Switzerland, is being re-exported from, from Switzerland, the convention, um, it comes into play. As I said, um, there are, or I didn't say that, but there are about 38,000 species of wild fauna and flora covered by the convention, 6,000 animal species and 32,000 plants. Um, and as I said, 3% of these are in Appendix 1 and 76-77% um, are in Appendix 2 and a very minor majority is in Appendix 3. And the difference between these, the main one you need to know of for today is that Appendix 1 species cannot be traded for commercial purposes. The convention covered trade in all specimens, live animals, dead animals, parts of animals, products that are derived from animals, including finished products, but also raw meat, fresh meat, um, any product made with meat or, or um, including meat um, from animals that are covered by the convention. So that's how much I'm going to say about the convention because um, we wanted to focus our attention on future pandemics. Um, so I put this question uh, a little bit of a, <laughs> of a rhetoric provocative question because the answer is obviously no. Um, CITES cannot be used uh, to prevent a future pandemic, at least not on its own. Um, but even so, I thought it might be useful to, um, to just mention a few of the reasons for this. 
So why can CITES not be used to prevent future pandemics? Because as I mentioned before, CITES does not regulate domestic trade. It only regulates international trade. So we've heard about wet markets and other types of markets where um, wild animals are traded. These are not the business of, of CITES. Um, and uh, we also know that uh, animals and birds move without being traded. They move from country to country and they, you know, um, wild boar or birds can come from, from uh, Africa to Europe or the other way and not wild boar, they won't travel from Africa, but birds might travel from Africa to Europe and they may carry zoonotic pathogens when they do that. And site is, is not regulating that. Nobody is regulating that. So there is a risk there that we need to think of um, that goes beyond the scope of CITES. Uh, secondly, again, I'm not an expert, but CITES will only regulate trade in threatened or endangered species of wild flora and flora, not domesticated species. And as uh, most of us have learned over this past couple of months where we've been reading about zoonotic pathogens, they are also found in livestock such as cattle, sheep, chicken, cats and dogs. And uh, a lot of trade is, is happening in products of those types of species, cattle for normal meat and chicken for consumption. So um, their scientists cannot play any role either. We do have about 900 mammals under the convention, about 1500 birds uh, in appendix one and two and some in appendix three. And so there potentially um, scientists could play a role. Um, we have also learned over the past couple of months that rodents are a potential carrier of zoonotic pathogens. Uh, rodents are um, bats, into, into bats and rats, mice, um, and, and these are uh, not, most of them are not covered by the convention. There are about 1500 species of rodents and we have only about a handful are covered by the convention. Um, and this is the question or the, the, the comment where it goes a little bit beyond my, my, experience, my, my expertise, but uh, just to mention that the risk of zoonotic pathogen spillover, i.e. The, the, the pathogen, the agent jumping from an animal species to a human being, um, depend on the species, but it depends on many other factors as well. How uh, the species is traded? Is it in cold chain? Um, what is the, the condition of the human being? Um, what is uh, the condition of the animal? Is it live animals? Has it been checked? Um, what is the, the prop, what is the, which country is it coming into? Some pathogens are a problem in some countries, not in other countries. So there are a lot of other factors that are beyond the, the scope and the control of, of, of CITES. I'll come back to some of them in a, in a bit where CITES may play a role. Um, let's see if we can get the next one. Uh, so there, as, there are also, as I sort of alluded to before, other contexts than international trade where um, animals come into, uh, wild animals come into contact with humans. We, we know this from uh, habitat destruction for, um, uh, you know, for urban development or for mining or from, for de deforestation that is taking place to allow for aquaculture. Roads are being put into uh, deep into a forest where there was no access before. All of a sudden, people are traveling there. They didn't used to travel there. Um, uh, wildlife maybe have may have lived in these forests or may still live in these forests, and and so there is a closer contact. Also, um, uh, zoonotic pathogens may jump from uh, wildlife to livestock, and then livestock pass it on to humans, and that's another. Uh, risk where where CITES is not really um, implicated or involved. Um, this um, the fact that CITES regulates trade means that some trade is illegal because all trade that is not in all trade that should be uh, accompanied by a, a CITES document or permit um, and is not is considered to be illegal. And um, we just I literally just participated in a discussion about illegal trade in bushmeat. Um, that is a potential, a big risk because bushmeat is potentially where uh, zoonotic pathogens could um, be carried from the wild into uh, contact with humans. 
um, and uh, some meat of wild animals are covered, um, but a lot is not covered by, by CITES. And if it's traded illegally, there will be little control and, uh, and little monitoring of such trade, and therefore potentially much more uh, risky than, than, um, than legal trade. And um, the convention has a strong compliance system and, and using this to monitor how well parties enforce the convention. So efforts are ongoing to reduce illegal trade in wildlife, but it will come as no surprise that, that more efforts are needed and more, um, more action is needed. And, and we have seen a lot of action stepping up in the past maybe half a decade or so. Um, I think it's important to note that if you prohibited all trade in wildlife, it wouldn't go away. It will still be there, but it would just not be as easy to tra track and it would not be as easy to monitor um, because um, as long as there is a demand, there will be a supply. So it's not by making it illegal that it disappears. Um, look at other international uh, trade area, areas of trade where we made it illegal, but it's still there. Drugs is just for one or or arms, it's regulated or illegal, but it's still there. And, and there is a risk that the same will happen here. And the problem of zoonotic diseases would increase rather than decrease if that was, um, if that, if that was uh, you know, the, the way to go, the way that was decided to go. Not to discuss all the, not to mention all the complicated technical and legal issues that uh, you'd have to address. Also, um, one more thing I think is important that uh, if, um, if it's illegal to trade in wildlife, there could be some perverse incentives for people not to look after the wildlife, not to look after the habitats where the wildlife is, is, is living. Um, and hence that there would be even more close contact between animals and, and humans than we see today. Um, yeah, just uh, one more comment here. Um, it's been sort of uh, mentioned that the current COVID-19 pandemic started from a pathogen in a bat that was then transferred, potentially, we don't know for sure, but it was transferred to, um, uh, to a pangolin and then traded internationally across borders. But um, pangolins, all the species, all known species of pangolins are already in Appendix 1. So no commercial trade should uh, occur in that species. So even, even if that was the case, the regulatory framework is still there to stop such, such trade from, from occurring. Um, finally, I, I thought I should just mention that the implementation of the convention is coordinated by, by national, nationally designated CITES management and scientific authorities that have very distinct roles and functions set out in the convention and in many of the recommendations that the resolutions uh, under the convention are, are um, asking them to perform. It's about you know, very practical things. And these, these authorities are generally not veterinarian services, you know, I've tried to, that, that, that deals with animal health. And I've made a comparison with the OIE delegates and the CITES management authorities. And only in a handful of cases do we have overlap between the veterinary services that are delegates to the International Animal Health Organization and the CITES management authorities. So, so um, that, that means that CITES management authorities are generally not equipped to assess and address risks of zoonotic pathogen spillovers. And by the way, the same goes for the CITES Secretariat. So, you know, we, we don't really have the knowledge and, and the capacity and we would need to, to build this if, if we were to, um, to try to prevent uh, um, animal health disease or, so on, or future pandemic. Um, so, so I think that's the last sort of, of the most obvious reasons I wanted to mention why CITES cannot prevent a future pandemic. But of course, that doesn't mean um, that CITES doesn't have a role to play. And um, I, I sort of wanted to give you a, a few things where, where I think CITES may contribute to reducing the risks. Obviously, um, continue to closely regulate, control and monitor trade and specimen of wild animals. Is, is critical to ensure that such trade is sustainable, legal, and traceable. Parties must, adhere, must continue to strictly adhere to this system, and perhaps more can be done in this area. And one of the questions that was already raised 
is sort of alluding to that. So I'll come back to that. But definitely we should continue to ensure that the trade regime on Recite is, is fulfilling um, its objectives so that no trade is, so that trade that is occurring is sustainable, legal and traceable. And if it's not, there should be effective enforcement, um, including uh, deterrent penalties. It's important to note that the convention itself requires that um, trade any specimen or products that is traded in violation of the provisions of the convention is illegal and must be um, subject to penalties and, uh, and uh, be con confiscated at the national level. Um, so if, it's, if it should have been traded with a document, it's traded without a document, it's illegal, can be confiscated and penalties sh should be, uh, or prosecutions should be, should be uh, mobilized. I'm saying this because I want to come back to the example of the um, domestic trade and wet markets. So what happens if we find on wet markets species um, that do not occur in that country? So they have, they have been imported or they come from, from, from farms, but if they have been imported, they, um, they should have been imported with a permit to be ordered in order to be allowed to be sold on a local market. If they were imported illegally and are sold on a local market, these species are illegal, these specimens are illegal and can be confiscated. So there is a little bit of, of interference into the local market, but only to the extent that something has crossed the border illegally and is now offered for sale at a domestic market. With, uh, that is one of the strengths of this convention. It should, um, should be confiscated and, and penalties sh should be mobilized. So. Um, there is already that provision in this, in this convention. Um, as I said before, where there's a demand, there is a supply, and therefore it's critically important that efforts to reduce demand for illegal wildlife products and targeted and, and very uh, well-informed and well-argumented efforts are taking place and, and are mobilized both at the, at, the, at the source country and in particular at destination countries. Um, so as I mentioned before, the International um, Animal Health Organization, OIE, is the one that is regulating trade in animals and animal products. There is clearly a need to strengthen co collaboration between the secretariats of OIE and the CITES secretariat at, at our level. And we are working towards that end. We have had several meetings, we're developing projects and concepts, and we're trying to see what can we do to effectively have a better links between the two um, systems. And, but I think more importantly, that needs to happen at the national level, at the domestic level, both in export and in import countries. There needs to be a much better understanding of each other's systems and better collaboration to prevent um, zoonotic pathogen spillover. However, not just CITES and OIE are important. Um, many other partners and actors at, at the international level um, and, and local levels uh, should be and should be and are mobilized. Um, just uh, um, WHO, WHO, the, the collaborative partnership on, on wild, sustainable wildlife, um, CMS, IUCN, Traffic, IATA, many, many, many organizations are looking inward and looking at their frameworks and their capacity to say, what can we do to help um, reduce this risk? Um, so under the, the convention, so we take all of that, we, we, we read all of that, we take all of that into consideration and in the secretariat and individual uh, parties are right now um, trying to reflect on, on what we can do under the CITES framework to um, develop and discuss and potentially adopt additional measures to, um, to reduce these risks. That could be short-term decisions where we identify what we need to know, what are the species that we think are pre present more risk or the specimens that present more risk and how can we then uh, deal with that in our regulation of trade. We could set up a partnership. We have already a partnership to reduce illegal trade. We could set up a similar partnership with, with relevant partners to reduce these uh, risk of, of pandemics. Um, and we could do this in a decision where we could suggest that parties adopt a new resolution at the coming, um, at the coming conference of the parties where they would uh, 
you know, promote, encourage, recommend these types of actions, which are, which are critically important. Um, it's, it's again, the point is again, that it's not the CITES on its own, but it's CITES with the collaboration of other partners and actors that will be able to, to um, contribute and hopefully um, contribute to reduce this risk. And, and yeah. hopefully uh, we won't see another, uh, this type of pandemic, but you can't be certain of that. So uh, there's two more points I wanted to mention. Um, the convention itself, as it was drafted in, in the, the 60s and early 70s, um, the, the, the drafters deliberately decided not to include public health and issues in the convention, but they made it very clear in, in the text of the convention that, um, that parties should not in any way be prevented from taking measures pertaining to public health or veterinary concerns. And, and most of you know that China and Vietnam has, have taken such measures in, in, um, during this current pandemic to try to reduce some of the risks. Some of the risks. And finally, um, scientists can also contribute to addressing the risks through better use of modern technologies. Um, for instance, to, uh, to have much better traceability systems in place that use modern technologies and to have better detection systems in place at border controls that will um, focus on, on risky um, shipments and, and, and so that resources can be spent on picking them up rather than controlling all shipments when there are shipments that are not presenting any risks. And finally, I thought I should mention that animals may also suffer from diseases. From, from diseases. And CITES has systems in place to facilitate transactions that can assist in diagnosis and, and help protect animals from what we could call animal pandemics, <laughs> um, if, including if this current pandemic should affect wild animals, which is by, by no, um, no means uh, excluded at all. Also material, biological material that might be used to develop a vaccine if it comes from protected animals or from animals that are regulated under CITES, um, may be subject to CITES controls. And again, we have simplified procedures for that. Um, so just very quickly, key takeaways. Um, CITES is a well-established agreement regulating international trade in wild fauna and flora to ensure that such trade is legal, sustainable, and traceable. CITES cannot prevent a future pandemic, but CITES can and should contribute to reducing the risk by ensuring that trade is safe, sustainable, legal, traceable. There are many factors involved in a pandemic and many players are mobilized and ready to contribute to preventing a future pandemic. And we, we of course welcome that and that is all, that is really all very um, important and welcomed. And this is another sort of attempt to um, bring together such partners. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Sophie, for this very interesting presentation. Many thanks for your animal selection <laughs> that helps us also <laughs> uh, see very clearly some of the, the species you are talking about. Thanks for highlighting very important aspects, uh, among others, uh, how scientists can contribute to reducing risk of future pandemics. Um, we have received some questions uh, through the chat function, so we are saving them for, for, for the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Uh, I will now give the floor to our next speaker, who is Dr. Gabrielle Marceau. Um, she will make a 10-minute intervention on the relationship between the W2 agreements and the multilateral environmental agreements, such as CITES and we'll also share views on how the WTO rules are relevant in the particular context of a pandemic. Um, Dr. Gabriel Marceau is Associate Professor at the University of Geneva and at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies and Senior Counselor in the Research Division of the WTO, which she joined in 1994. From September 2005 to January 2010, she was part of the cabinet of the WTO Director General, Pascal Lamy. Before joining the GATT and the WTO, Gabrielle worked in private practice in Canada. She has published extensively, particularly in WTO-related matters. Gabrielle, it's a pleasure to give you the floor, please. Thank you very much to uh, Sophie and all those who invited me. And um, in 10 minutes, I want to pass three messages. 
say a word about the new balance trade and non-trade concern under the WTO agreement, the WTO and MEAs, and after the WTO CITES and the pandemic. So um, if you look at the preamble of the WTO, which um, Sophia will uh, share with you, which is different from what existed in the GATT, there is a new goal in the WTO, which is mentioned here. I don't know whether you see my um, sort of arrow, the objective of sustainable development. And this has allowed the WTO to almost make a U-turn on trade and health, trade and environment from the GATT. And in early on in the first cases um, that we had, the appellate body was able uh, to read the provisions of the WTO, in particular, the provisions of the GATT that you can see on the screen in a second or two um, differently. And I'm just saying this as an introduction um, because for the first time in the very first case of the WTO, the appellate body mentioned that governments, of course, have trade obligations with the GATT, but they also have um, rights as government and obligations vis-a-vis -vis their people. And therefore, the provisions that allow governments to take actions to protect health or conserve natural resources or even public morals that could become important for pandemic are to be interpreted as equally uh, important as the trade rules. So the appellate body talked about a balance that is that trade and non-trade concern are sort of equal and must be balanced properly. And this is very relevant when we talk about issues uh, such as environment and health where there are many MEAs. So if I go to my second topic on MEAs, there's no uh, slide as such, but very, very soon and repeated several times, the appellate body also said that the right of governments to invoke non-trade policies, such as protection of health of the environment, can be policies unilaterally determined. So a government can go ahead, even if there's no multilateral treaty supporting its approach so long as the actions are really done to protect the environment or health. So the implications is that if a government acts in accordance with an existing MEAs, it is certainly in a better position than if it acts unilaterally. If a government has the right to act unilaterally, it has even furthermore right to act in support of an MEA. So the relationship between MEA and WTO is that they are clearly relevant to support actions for instance, under the, um, GATT, the, the old GATT Article 20. Now, if you look at the preamble of a new WTO agreement, the SPS agreement has developed Article 20 in the area of sanitary and phytosanitary measures. And this preamble repeats essentially the principles that I just mentioned, that there is a need for governments, of course, to rely to, uh, on international standards and on relevant organization and all this. But the overall goal is what is mentioned in the last sentence, that governments have the right to set their own appropriate level of protection of animal, human, and plant life. So this is the background. And for the last sort of few minutes, WTO, CITES, and uh, the pandemic. <clears throat> so WTO deals with trade. It doesn't deal only with trade in animal. It doesn't deal with pandemics. It deals with trade generally, and it generally prohibits unjustified discrimination, unjustified restrictions. But restrictions as such are not prohibited if they are justified. And that's the point. With the pandemic, uh, of course, there are all sorts of problems, and uh, Sophie explained the origin of many pandemics. I'm not an expert either, but I understand that 60% of the pathogen, the, 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 the disease, 
are a fine roots in wildlife. Uh, that is to say, uh, all forms of wildlife. And as it was said, it's not trade only. It's of course the movement of those animals and the movements would take place uh, in any case. Can the WTO and what is the role of the WTO in helping dealing with pandemics? Then the issue is much broader. A pandemic is of course calling for actions to try to limit the uh, the pandemic, the source of the problems. And for this, the WTO can work with, as mentioned, the Office of Episotic. It can deal and must deal with CITES and others. But the pandemic is not only about containing the um, sort of pandemic through which some actions can be taken, such as trade board or trade restrictions uh, with animals, but there are, of course, all sorts of issues that are necessary to protect the health of human beings. So this is where you saw some governments putting restrictions on ventilators, export restrictions on ventilators and masks because they want to keep them for themselves. This is also very relevant, but the WTO regulates that and says export restrictions should be temporary. But they can also be import restrictions, as I mentioned, for animals, again, if they're justified, the WTO has rules favoring vaccine, vaccinations that need to be developed in the context of a pandemic. In the context of a pandemic, you also need to adapt some regulation, border regulations, so instruments, health products that you need can come quickly. In Canada, I understand, for instance, that the label requirements that everything be translated was some, for some time suspended so governments can import more quickly what they need to import for dealing with the health issue. There are also issues about subsidies. Of course, if you prohibit people from going out, you may give them money to replace their salary. You may support companies. So you can see that the role uh, or the scope of the WTO is broader, if you want, than CITES, but much less experts than other organizations. And this is why WTO not only can work with others, but the only way out of the pandemic is, of course, that all these uh, organizations work together. And it was well said by Sophie, it's human beings who have created directly or indirectly those pandemics. It's human beings that will need to resolve that through their change of life, etc. And one organization alone cannot and certainly not the WTO. So I may end in referring to this uh, One Health approach that was um, sort of encouraged when CITES and OIE got together in 2015, I think. It's because pandemics are complex issues that are not only linked to trade, and even if you ban trade, you don't solve the problem. So it's only in working together that it's possible. And this pandemic points to the need for further collaborations between all actors, IGOs like CITES and WTO, but also private entities, etc. So I'll finish and uh, to leave more time for a uh, discussion. Thank you. Many thanks, Gabrielle, for your presentation and for uh, raising a very interesting topics that participants uh, would like to follow up on. Before addressing the questions that have been sent to us through the chat function, I would like to give the floor um, to Mr. Marcus Picard from the Economic Cooperation and Trade Division from the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Marcus will make a, a, a short intervention to talk about UNECE um, electronic uh, permit system that UNECE has uh, put in place uh, regarding the CITES uh, convention. So uh, Marcus, uh, you have the floor. Yes, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for giving us uh, the floor in this meeting. Uh, can you understand me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. Uh, speaking of technology, I have um, connected here with two computers and I got the audio on the run on, uh, over the telephone. Uh, 
Um, so in the, this little questionnaire that uh, was distributed in the beginning of the meeting, I checked both boxes with know very well about CITES and know very well about the uh, uh, WTO. Uh, my role in UNECE is UNEC develops uh, standards and best practice for international trade. And um, in this capacity, I've worked uh, three years uh, on secondment in the society secretariat uh, inter alia with Sophie on uh, developing an e society strategy. Uh, so it's, it's very nice that after one year being back to UNEC, I'm sitting again on a, on a panel with colleagues um, from, from CITES. Um, CITES uh, Sophie already mentioned that uh, trade in wildlife and CITES registered species is only a part of international trade in agriculture and bioproducts, uh, which is uh, uh, annually about 1.5 trillion uh, US dollar in trade. Um, uh, so that, that's a very significant uh, international trade. This trade is regulated um, and the, the trade controls in agriculture trade are based on the issuance and control of licenses, permits and certificates. Um, CITES permits were already mentioned, but also sanitary, phytosanitary certificates, food quality, food safety certificates, and so on. And all these uh, certificates mitigate risk of transmission of zoonosis or pests and, and diseases uh, to humans or to the environment. Uh, these documents uh, that are exchanged and used for the control in, are issued in paper and electronic format and um, they are based on UNECE standards and they have been uh, adopted by international conventions uh, such as Society's Conference of Parties or uh, the International Plant Protection Convention or OIE. Now, I already said that today many of these documents are already issued and exchanged in electronic format and through electronic control systems. And these systems provide for transparency in the control procedures. They reduce uh, the risk for uh, incidents for corruption and they are a basis for science-based control approaches such as electronic risk management interagency inter collaboration and the controls and uh, uh, newer technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain and so on. <clears throat> and for better control of CITES regulated species, it is very important that governments are now uh, uh, fostering the implementation of these controls. Um, if, if you look in, in, in CITES, what we do in ECE, we are supporting governments in the implementation of electronic systems. I just mentioned you three things uh, that we are currently involved in. Uh, so we're working with society secretary at um to help governments to uh, implement electronic cloud-based electronic permit systems, which uh, have been developed or have been uh, are now available since about uh, a year. And so the first countries are already implementing the system. Uh, we are working with the European Commission on standards for a new European wide exchange hub for electronic CITES permits uh, within the EU Tracer system. And we have recently set up a task force where member states can meet to launch pilot projects on CITES permit on CITES electronic permit information exchange between governments. So the purpose of these pilots is to have an end-to-end -end regulatory control of trade in wildlife. Now all these systems will help to better control trade in wildlife and with this they will help to mitigate future events of spreading zoonosis and other animal and plant-borne diseases. However, if we compare the state of uptake of electronic control system in CITES and we compare it with the rest of the agri-food and bio-trade sector, then we see that trade in wildlife is still significantly lagging behind. And in particular, in the context of COVID-19, it's now very important to accelerate the uptake, uptake of technology and modern control processes
uh, in this sector. And I hope that uh, events like this organized today are raising the awareness of governments to uh, close this gap in the, in the international control system. Thank you. Many thanks, Marcos, for your contribution on how this uh, uh, permit system works. I will now open the floor uh, to, to other uh, participants who have submitted questions uh, through the chat function. And perhaps in order to connect to the point on, on permits raised by Marcus and also raised by Sophie in her presentation, we have a, a question here um, to the panelists. Uh, uh, the, a participant asked whether there are issues with the use of permits and can some countries obtain these permits easily with an economic incentive? I guess that the question is uh, about the functioning of the permit system, whether uh, it's, a, it's a, an, an easy system to implement. And uh, if I would like to also share um, a comment that another participant made in connection to the fact that uh, CITES doesn't cover health issues. So I can read the question, uh, Sophie, if I may. Uh, the comment is, uh, I assume that to cover health issues, the convention would require respective amendments. Also, the management authorities are mostly not competent in these issues. As Sophie just mentioned, the only option is probably if we start asking veterinary certificates before issuing CITES permits though I'm not sure it's feasible for countries. So there's a question about the feasibility of asking veterinary certificates uh, before issuing CITES permits. So that would be the second question related to permits. And um, perhaps I can address those questions to you, Sophie, and then I address other questions. Thank you. So, so thank you very much for these, these questions related to the CITES permit system. I think they were very good. And I also think that these are some of the questions that parties will have to uh, address when they come together. And possibly some of them are also already um, thinking of how, how these could, could be addressed. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the CITES standing committee has not had a, an opportunity to meet since this um, COVID outbreak and nor, nor has decided animals or plants committees been able to meet as they were supposed to meet this summer. Um, so there hasn't been an opportunity for the parties to discuss which approach and, and how they want to go about um, looking into what measures could potentially be taken um, by the under, under the auspices or under in the framework of CITES. Um, I, the, the, uh, the issue of requiring a veterinary certificate before issuing an expert permit is, is uh, a, an idea that I think they should look at. The problem is that a veterinary permit in, the, in export, I mean, in a veterinary permit in an export country may say that there is no problem in the export country, but the same animal could pose a problem in the import country um, because, as I said, pathogens act differently in different contexts. So, so that wouldn't necessarily be enough, um, but it's definitely a, a way to, um, something to think about. Um, the first question uh, I understand is, I understand it as, is it easy to obtain a permit? Uh, without actually fulfilling the requirements. Um, and there are conditions, permits are not just issued um, uh, against monetary incentives. There are conditions in the convention for uh, issuance of export permits. And such conditions are known to everyone, including the import countries. And, and import countries are encouraged to exercise due diligence if they have concerns about whether or not these conditions have been met. So it's, um, it's not as simple as that. Um, you don't just pay and you get a permit. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, incidents of corruption as we see everywhere, but, but we've actually, in the context of CITES, adopted uh, a resolution that um, requires or recommends that parties take action to combat the risks of or to identify and address risks of of corruption. We have a, a whole guide on this that has been developed by the UNODC, both with relate to, to wildlife and forestry and fisheries. So there are, there, that is an issue, but that's an issue not only for CITES, it's an issue in many places. And so um, 
we are we are sort of confronting that and, and trying to address it as best as we can. But again, this is an issue that needs to be addressed at the national level, and we will support with training, guidance, and capacity building as much as we can. I think those address the two questions. Thank you. Yes, many thanks, Sophie. Um, mindful of the time, um, I would like to ask participants whether they are able to stay like 10 more minutes with us or 15 minutes because we are engaging in this conversation. Speakers have uh, very kindly accepted to do so. So uh, having said that, we may still take some questions and of course we will be very happy to follow up on the questions that will remain unanswered because of the <laughs> limited time we have. Allow me to read another question from a participant that is also uh, addressed to you, Sophie, and it says the following. Citrus contains language in several articles requiring that live animals intended for export be so prepared and shipped as to minimize, quotation marks, damage to health. End of quotation. This phrase has never been precisely defined. Could this language be held to cover such things as added stress resulting in a compromised immune system or risk of infection from exposure to diseased animals during shipment? If so, could it be used as the basis for developing CITES measures such as resolution or guidelines to reduce the likelihood that traded specimens will carry or transmit zoonotic pathogens? It's a, a very detailed question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You want to go ahead right away? Okay. So, um, so this is a, a good question. Um, and um, let me just, for those who are not as familiar with CITES as, as the answer, the, the, the person who asked this question, we, the convention requires that when um, live specimens, so we talk about live animals here, are, are in trade, so they are transported from one country to the other, they should be uh, so prepared and transported so that they won't, uh, um, become unnecessary uh, unnec so that they are protected so no no unnecessary stre uh, stress no health issues etc minimize those risks and uh, the way that the CITES parties have decided to implement this is by saying um, we need to uh, parties need to comply with the IATA live animal regulations so IATA is the International Air Tra Transport Association and they have very detailed um, regulations on how you transport live animals, um, both with regard to the documents that are required, but also with regard to the physical containers and, and um, access to light, to air, to water, to food, all of that, how much space, all of that is very detailed, regulated by the live animal regulations. Um, and you need to, so CITES in a resolution called 10.21 have decided that Compliance with CITES requires compliance with these regulations. Although they're not established by CITES parties, that's how CITES have decided that this is the best, the best way. And even if animals are not transport, transported by air, they still uh, pretty much apply in the same way when it's by road or by rail. Um, the, the live animal regulations are overseen or adapted regularly. I think they have meetings in the board, the law board, uh, Two, uh, two times, twice a year. Um, so there was one in May, probably one coming up uh, in the fall, in October. And uh, I participated in the meeting in May and we decided to set up a little task force to see if there were anything we needed to do to the live animal regulations to better address risks of, of zoonotic pathogen spillover. Um, so, so that is underway. We, we will be scrutinizing the, these regulations. But already, I can already now tell you that veterinary certificates are obviously required to make sure that animals are not transported when they're sick, when they're pregnant, whatever else is a sort of uh, additional risks that they could be um, exposed to. So, so there is already sort of documentary requirements in, in the regulations, but it could be that more can be done. So obviously, uh, we, we're, we're looking into that. But thank you for the question, and and um, we'll. I can't respond right now, but we are looking into it. Thanks very much for your answer, Sophie. And I would like to give the floor to Gabriel, who would like to to make a follow up comment. Please, yes. Gabriel. Thank you. Very briefly, I see that all the questions are about better and improve uh, control of animal trade 
And as I mentioned, I think there's absolutely no WTO problem with all those form of controls and restrictions, so long as there's no discrimination based on origin. But um, it's a bit funny for me to say that, but I would just add that, you know, I think if we want to deal with future pandemic, we have to deal with the source of the problems. The animals carry, and it's normal that we want to protect ourselves, but the reasons why these disease jump from animals to human beings when animals don't get sick and we get sick, it's because of this relationship human animals that we have damaged. Or, so I'm, I'm referring to deforestation, to uh, all sorts of actions um, that are necessary on a deeper level, other than permits. Again, I, have, I think this is perfectly okay for crisis, but it doesn't deal with the source. And yes, CITES maybe should be given more uh, power for uh, dealing not only with restrictions of trade in animals, but possibly public health. But as Sophie and I were discussing a day or two ago, uh, it's also an enormous convention where consensus will need to be built if you want to introduce new public and human policy for health there. So there's no easy solution for future pandemic. It requires collaboration. It requires maybe development of new things in societies. But more importantly, in my view, it requires an examination of why is it that the problems have started with. And permits is a sort of a way to limit the damage. It doesn't deal with the source. Thank you. Many thanks, Gabrielle. I'd like to take one more question from a participant. Um, I'm going to read it, and it's also on CITES. The preamble of CITES states that, in quotation marks, peoples and states are and should be the best protectors of their own wild fauna and flora, end of quote. While CITES regulates exclusively international trade, the absence of overseeing mechanisms for looking at what happens within countries for instance, hunting practices, internal wildlife market and trade, may defeat to some extent the purpose of CITES. The question is, could it be envisaged to foster the partnership with the Convention on Biodiversity? So the question is whether the CITES is envisaging fostering partnership with the CBD Convention. Um, thank you very much. I think this is, this is, uh already in place. We do have partnerships with the CBD and we work with, with CBD uh, on a daily basis. We don't, we don't only work with CBD, but with many other relevant um, organizations and, and, and uh, uh, MEAs. So we have different groups in which we work together. We have this uh, CPW that I mentioned, which is uh, the Collaboration Partnership of Wildlife, Sustainable Wildlife Use and, and other partnerships. So that, so we already work on this. And I, I the, the 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 sort of the reason for this particular preambular paragraph is to say that it's we shouldn't be deciding on what um, national governments want to do with their wildlife. It's their decision, um, but th still there should be some sort of oversight, and we shouldn't. So international trade shouldn't lead to um, uh, the overexploitation and, and 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 extinction of species, and that's why we put in. In the, that's why the convention was uh, developed and adopted. But, but, and so but parties can decide uh, whether they want to trade sustainable, legally, et cetera. But they can also decide that they don't want to trade at all if that's, if that's their policy. So that's, that's sort of respecting that the partners, the parties have their own, they decide over their resources. Having said that, I, I wanted to say, coming back to the issue of whether or not CITES can have an impact on domestic trade, um, that we are actually uh, finalizing a study on what um, what frameworks and controls are in place at the domestic market uh, for trade in Appendix 1 listed species, because as I mentioned before, Appendix 1 listed species are not supposed to be traded internationally for commercial purposes. And if they are found at the national level, in at the, global, at the domestic market, in countries where these species do not occur, we need to make sure that they have uh, entered into those markets in a legal way. And so we've, we've tried to figure out what controls are in place at the local level, at the domestic level. And we've looked at, I think, at 10 countries or something like that. And actually, 
there are controls in place. So it is very difficult to trade in an Appendix 1 listed species in a domestic market, despite the fact that it's not a requirement under CITES that you cannot trade domestically in Appendix 1 listed species. But in many, many countries, that is not possible unless you get a very specific explicit permit to do so. So, so despite the fact that I said it's beyond the scope of the convention, it, we are actually looking at it and try to see if there are things that could be further addressed or recommendations we could make further in this regard. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to really say, yes, we are of course working with the CBD on these issues and we are actually also looking a little bit on, on control of domestic trade. But again, I, I think what Gabriella just said, this are, these are dealing with symptoms. It's not dealing with the, with the cause or the source of the, of, of, of the pandemic. They, these are all things we're doing to address something that should be addressed. I have this buck in my office at a whole different level which is much more difficult. It's much more complicated to say, we don't want to have deforestation. We don't want to have urbanization. We These are much more complicated um, equations to solve. And so it's much more easy to say, well, let's look at CITES and fix that problem with fixing CITES, but that's not going to fix the problem. And that's what I was trying to say. And I, and I appreciate that Gabri Gabriella said the same thing. Thanks. Many thanks. Well, before closing, I would like to ask you both, Gabriel and Sophie, whether you would like to make some concluding remarks. Should I start with you, Gabriel, please? Yes, mine will be very brief. It was very interesting experience for me to see and understand that Sophie and I, we agree on everything. Uh, both the source of the problem, how to deal, the emergency, uh, which doesn't mean that there's a um, repetition it means that the two convention or agreement deal with different aspects, but on the substance, WTO allows for restrictions for protection and CITES uh, sort of operate those with permits or otherwise, but the source of the problem and the solution are not with those agreements. The solutions are just with the way we live and that's very complicated. And finally, of course, we know WTO deals with other aspects like the public health and the need, for instance, to provide subsidies in times of crisis, which is broader than CITES. But I was delighted to agree with Sophie on everything. There's absolutely no conflict or contradiction. Everything is possible. Thank you. Many thanks, Gabriel. On that positive note, I would like to give the floor now to Sophie for some concluding remarks. Thank you. Yes, um, I just really, in, in the same vein, want to um, uh, refer to a statement that has been recently produced by uh, something called the CPW, uh, which is the, um, the Collaborative Partnership on Sustainable Wildlife Management that comprises 14 different agencies involved in this business. And they have come out with four guiding principles on how to address the sources of a, a pandemic and, and what is required, what you know, the four principles that we need to look at. We can't just look at one. We can't only look at, at wildlife trade. That's potentially one thing we should look at, but it can't be the only one. So I don't want to go into detail here. We don't have time, but I just will like you to um, keep an eye out for that. It's called the COVID-19 challenge, zoonotic diseases and wildlife. And the other thing I wanted to say very quickly is that there are knowns and unknowns in this business and I think before we do take uh, very drastic uh, measures we need to have clarity on what we know and what we don't know and what we can do effectively on recitals uh, to address what we know and possibly be precautionary and, and, and address some of the things we don't know but I think we don't we shouldn't be rushing into making bold um, decisions before we have a better understanding of the role of, of CITES in this context. So those were my two, and, I, and as I said, we need, and I've said this many times, but we need, we need discussions like this and we need all actors around the table, including WTO, WHO, OIE and everybody else in order to devise these, these solutions. So thank you very much for having me in the panel. And thank you for uh, saying that we agree on everything, Gabriela. We should, <laughs> we should celebrate that. <laughs> thank you. Many thanks. I would like to ask Professor Makandenge if he would like to, to say some comments uh, before closing. Well, I, I just wanted to, to thank very much all our speakers. I, it was really a great discussion, amazing presentations, and I enjoyed also the Q&A. Q &A. 
session. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to see that our second uh, uh, webinar on, on trade knowledge is very successful and very well attended. And I'm looking forward then to welcoming everybody to the, to the next one. So thank you again very much, Elzo Soledad, for excellent moderation and Sophia and Lisbeth for all the coordination and and, uh, and the organization of uh, of this session thank you to all thanks very much professor thanks very much to the speakers thanks to everyone for your interest so the next webinar will be held in mid november and we will uh, get back to you very soon with the date and the topic thanks very much for joining have a nice day nice afternoon bye